Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so welcome to the latest in our colloquium series on new work in the concepts of health and disease. Can I just check first off that everyone online can, uh, can hear me okay? Can someone give me a thumbs up or a yes in the chat or something if you can hear okay? I'm seeing a thumbs up, that's good. Um, uh, so before we get started, I'd just like to, to say some quick thanks to the, uh, the Saudi Foundation for funding this talk in particular, this colloquium series more broadly, and in fact, Pretty much everything we do, uh, it's uh, yeah, none of it would happen without without that generous. So thanks to the Saudi Foundation. This evening, it's my great pleasure to welcome Helena Scott Fortsman uh, from Cambridge University, who's going to be giving a talk entitled "Representing Broken Bones." So over to you. Thank you. Right. Um, so I hope everyone online and in the room can see me properly. There's a lot of technical equipment here. Um, okay, so uh, hello everyone uh, online. I can't see you unfortunately, but hopefully that will happen later and uh, in the room. I'm really happy and very honored to be here. Uh, so thank you for Rika for inviting me, to Rika for inviting me and to Nick for introducing me and, and to all the other people at uh, Philosophy and Medicine uh, Initiative. Um, Right. So first, just a few uh, introductory notes. I have to mention that the work I've been uh, doing to present here today is supported by the Carlsberg Foundation. Um, and this is perhaps also worth mentioning because uh, you'll see Carlsberg associated with my name here on the slide and also uh, elsewhere. And I just want to clarify that my work is not related in any way to alcohol intake or production. Uh, in fact, Carlsberg, uh, the Carlsberg Foundation is one of the major research foundations in uh, Denmark, funding both uh, humanities and sciences research. Um, I should also mention that the work I'll be presenting is uh, deeply rooted in ethnographic fieldwork that I did uh, and was very kindly allowed to do in an orthopedic surgical unit in Denmark, uh, to which I owe many of the points I'll be presenting. Uh, and I also owe much of my knowledge uh, in this area to Professor Steve uh, Poisson, uh, one of the leading specialists on uh, proximal humerus fractures. I don't know exactly how to say it in English, I'm practicing. Um, and also one of the rare people uh, in the world who uh, is trained both as a philosopher and an orthopedic surgeon. So that's very exciting. Um, right. Uh, uh, nope. It's trying to change the slide. Great. Thank you. Okay. So let's get on with the talk. The first thing uh, I'll do is just give a brief frame of the talk in terms of the aims and the interests uh, that have motivated the talk. Uh, will you let me know if they can hear me and everything's... Yeah, I checked at the start, so that should be okay, fine. And if, if we, we can see on the chat here, so if any issues come up, we should... You'll shout if there's something yeah. up. Yeah. Perfect. Um, then I'll go on to tell you a bit about representing broken bones. So this is the sort of more uh, practice embedded part of the talk. Uh, I'll introduce you to the near classification system. Uh, what is it? What function? What functions does it serve? Uh, I'll share a few curious scenarios with you from my fieldwork to exemplify what I mean when I write um, the classification system being unproblematically problematic in my uh, abstract. Uh, and then the sort of second major part of the talk is the more philosophical part where I draw on uh, philosophy of science to look at how we might uh, conceptualize classificatory systems as relying on analogical reasoning through uh, recognizing similarity, but also that we can unfold the notion of analogical reasoning uh, from its characteristics uh, used in literature and models in science, and that such unfolding uh, might allow us a better framework of understanding uh, cognitive and epistemic elements of um, classification or roles of classification, uh, even when the final verdict uh, of class seems underdetermined or empty. And then finally, in the abstract, I promised uh, to say a very uh, relate this to uh, other domains of uh, medicine. I'm not sure I'll have time for that, but I do have a slide on it so we can discuss it in the QA perhaps. Right. Okay. So the first thing to mention is uh, that this is the first time I'm presenting uh, on these ideas and on this project. Uh, so I'm sure there'll be plenty of room for uh, improvement. And you might also uh, realize that in, in certain uh, areas of the talk, I'm scoping out the philosophical landscape quite a lot um, to find a proper place. And, and for both of these reasons, I'm uh, 
uh, just very keen to hear any thoughts that you have, questions, comments, critiques, ideas, everything is really welcome. Um, however, sort of in, in, in order to frame this discussion and also to help you understand what I'm trying to get at, if, if at some points in the discussion, uh, in the talk, it's, it's not really clear, uh, I thought I'd just briefly say something about what I'm interested in and where I'm trying to get to. So the overall uh, research interest that I have is an interest in clinical inquiry. Uh, so that's the sort of epistemic or normatic aspects of uh, medicine, depending how we think about uh, medical practice. Um, so when doctors try and find out what's what's wrong with patients, and then I'm doing this in a, in a practice perspective. So I'm interested in how that works in practice in the clinical uh, space. For this particular project, I'm looking at the role of classifications in this pra practice. And I just want to unfold this by a sort of somewhat crude picture of the debates in medical on medical classification that I think are currently uh, in the philosophical literature. And many of you will know this literature, and you might also disagree with my uh, my sort of uh, picture of it. Uh, but I hope you will sort of get what I'm trying to to do with this picture. So I think that the first um, considerable amount of literature on the notion of classification looks at the relation between classifications and its and the targets. Uh, so which kinds of things are classifications meant to, or do they in fact pick out? Uh, natural kinds, ideal kinds, social constructs. Um, is there only one way uh, to classify, or are there many right ways to classify? And how do we evaluate whether uh, the one we're using is the right one, and if you're using it in the right way? So these types of debate often relate to um, uh, um, the disease concept debate, which uh, many of the previous talks in the series have uh, given us a lot of uh, fascinating perspectives on. In this talk, however, I'm trying to take a slightly uh, different question or tackle a slightly different questions, question. So uh, I won't be talking about uh, the targets and classifications, but we can discuss that more in the Q&A if we find that uh, relevant. So the second, uh, section of the literature, I think, can be class uh, can be sort of classified, funny, classifying mm -hmm. classification. Anyway, uh, as uh, functions of classification in the broader scope of medicine. So, what role does classification play in coming up with plans for action? Uh, what existential social functions does classification and diagnostics have? What should they have? And are classification sort of an essential part of the clinical practice? Here. Uh, maybe I should just briefly note that uh, sometimes I use classification and diagnostics in, a, in an interchangeable way. Laura Koik has pointed out that those two concepts are not always coextensive, and I try to stick with uh, classification for this talk, but when I've looked at the literature, uh, I think it would be a mistake to, to distinguish classification and, and, and texts on, on diagnostics and classification, so there is some uh, overlap. Right. Um, Finally, then, there is a branch of the literature which focuses on clinical reasoning, and this is uh, where my talk sits. Um, so while I might comment on uh, things about the classification system that I will introduce you to, such as, is it a good system? What type of ontology might it rely on? Um, what functions does it serve? And so on. And I'm happy to answer questions on this. That's not really what I'm interested in in this talk. So. Uh, what I'm interested in is, is what role does it play in the clinical reasoning uh, sort of uh, question or the clinical reason, reasoning question. So, yeah. So this literature, I think, uh, has inherited, so the clinical reasoning literature, uh, a sort of seriousness about uh, the role of classification uh, and the accuracy of the inferences needed to classify in medical uh, practice. So maybe they've inherited it from uh, philosophy of science, uh, but maybe they've also inherited it from uh, these two existing uh, or surrounding debates that I've just mapped out. So getting classification right seem really important if we think that uh, classification serves as the one step in, in sort of further clinical reasoning. Uh, it can also seem very important when we have these vast debates about uh, what what types of things classifications pick out that we actually do get at these types of things. So for example, in the Stanford Encyclopedia uh, entry on philosophy of medicine, uh, Reisen and Kenny uh, writes, 
The key philosophical issue that arises in this context of diagnoses relate to how such determination can be made in a manner that is accurate, uh, given the high amount of uncertainty and complexity often associated with the human condition. So accuracy is a very important uh, notion of, of thinking about classification and uh, reasoning. So my first big surprise then, uh, when I did my fieldwork, so the first fieldwork I did in an orthopedic surgical unit was to discover sort of a rather discon or not concerned look on the clinician's face when he told me that classifications were often rather inaccurate or loose, so they didn't really fit. So I knew this, of course, um, from all the philosophical literature discussing it, uh, but it was my understanding that it would be more of a problem for the surgeon. Um, and, and surgeons I was encountering didn't really sort of express the appropriate uh, problem that I was expecting. So then if it seems that the purpose, at least for these surgeons of classification is not, um, at least not in the day-to-day -to, -day, to find these true fits or, or that it's not a problem that we don't find them, but surgeons still do discuss classifications and the classifications actually do seem to serve some function in their inquiry. Um, what exactly is this function? And that's sort of uh, where this talk, come from, talk comes from. Right. Okay, so let's get on to the case study. Uh, what is the near classification system? So this is what it looks like. Uh, the near classification system is a system for classifying proximal humerus fractures, which uh, means fractures in the very upper part of the uh, upper arm bone. So basically it's what we would call sh broken shoulders. Um, so uh, the system here uh, presented was proposed by Charles Near, or actually Charles S. Near II, uh, in 1970 under the name of uh, four-segment uh, four classification system as an alternative to existing classification systems that Near found uh, useless uh, and they've since been uh, sort of disappeared, so, so perhaps he was right. He argues that this uh, new system he's proposing uh, provides better understanding of the more complex shoulder injuries, uh, and also says uh, that um, it is not meant to be a numerical classification uh, that is oversimplified or patterned for easy Hoenken classification, but rather that it's a concept, a mental picture of the actual uh, pathomechanics and pathoanatomy. The classification is based on a system that takes into account uh, the amount of clearly separated pieces of, or segments that the bone has split into. And you can see that there's two part, three part, four part, and then there's the minimally displaced, which doesn't have any uh, separation. Um, the anatomical identification of these pieces, including the secondary references that such identification uh, has to the soft structures around the bone and any injuries that might have happened on those uh, in the uh, in the fracture, and then the integrity of the joint surface, which you can see on the uh, lower part of the classification scheme. The original classification in 1970 was published as a mere description, but in 20 uh, two, uh, two, uh, 2002, uh, Nia published a slightly modified version uh, along with a defense against some of the attacks that uh, the classification system had seen, uh, where it was accompanied by this pictorial representation, uh, which has now almost become synonymous with the classification. It exists in, so this is actually the original, uh, exists, in, exists in many different versions. I just find this one uh, more easy to navigate. I'll be using this one. So here is just the slide to show you that this type of uh, pictorial schematic classification system is rather typical for orthopedic surgery. Um, there's lots of different classification. These are just examples from the uh, upper limbs. Um, I'll focus on the near classification. So how does it work then? The idea is that uh, this way of classifying bones according to the parts and the anatomical identification tells us something about the stability of the fracture. Uh, that is, how likely is it that the fracture will heal and or conversely, how likely is it that the fracture will slide and even uh, get worse. It also tells us something about uh, what kinds of problems, if any, 
non-anatomical healing might cause. And non-anatomical healing is especially a problem for the um, uh, fractures that have uh, joint uh, intersection. So for example, here is a picture, uh, an X-ray of an impacted two part fracture um, where you have the first picture, which is from the admission. And then the second picture, which is from five months later, that's a non-anatomical healing. So you see that the bone, even when it's healed still doesn't really look like we would expect an X-ray of a bone. Uh, so here to accompany it is the patient. Um, and you can see that in spite of this non-anatomical healing, uh, she has almost full movement of her uh, arm and uh, no pain at this point. And this is a case that uh, was published by uh, Borson um, that I've, I've taken from his research. Right. So in uh, the clinical practice that I observed, often the way that this um, uh, classification would be applied would be that in the morning before uh, a, a day in the um, outpatient clinic, a more experienced uh, clinician would sit down with one or two um, training, surgeons in training and run through the images of the patients of the day, discussing the classifications of the fractures and any potential important things to clarify with the patients. Um, now, uh, the classification in the clinic where I was observing became very important because they were also recruiting patients for clinical trials. and. Uh, reports of clinical trials, there is in reports of clinical trials, there is a, uh, an expectation that you have this sort of a very precise classification uh, going with, with every patient case. Conventions here stipulate that when you do the classification for clinical trials, they should happen on the first, so the admission anterior posterior image, and that means the, the frontal image rather than the side uh, image. Um, However, as we should see in a minute, uh, there might be reasons uh, to classify using other inputs than this type of um, uh, image. Uh, and later in the talk, we'll see that there's also reasons to classify even when you're not including patients in clinical trials. Right, so I've indicated my first uh, encounter in the clinic with this phenomenon that I call the unproblematically problematic uh, classification. Uh, so this, um, let's call it like a surprising lack of alarm in surgeons about the state of the classificatory systems. Um, so since the near classification system was introduced in the 1970s, or in the in 1970, uh, it has become one of the most wide, or it has become the most widespread classification system for shoulder fractures. It has also been proven many times over to have relatively low inter-observer reliability. Uh, this seems generally to be the case for many orthopedic uh, classifications. So this low reliability is not a new thing. It's been known for quite a while, at least since the um, 1990s. Studies also indicate, indicate that there are higher inter-observer reliability for treatment recommendations than for classification. So one might wonder, why don't we just make doctors give us treatment recommendations? Why do we go through this whole sort of classification step that doesn't seem to be very reliable? Despite this, the classification seem still is used in the clinic today. And surgeons very sort of casually spoke to me about this lack of reliability, and then without further ado, went on to use it. So while, of course, this might be a matter of uh, pragmatic habit or lack of better alternatives. Uh, and maybe actually the near classification system is a bad system and it can be replaced by a much more reliable system. I, I don't know enough about broken shoulders to tell you. Uh, I think there is still something rather interesting to learn from the fact uh, that it seems to be useful to the clinicians, even uh, in spite of its inefficiency. So here are two scenarios. Yeah. Why are they using it? Um, here are two scenarios. From my I'm in the outpatient clinic for shoulder patients with a surgeon in training. Let's call him Alex. Today, today, the more experienced surgeon is away from eating and Alex is on his own. The next patient is someone who has been referred from the AE. It has been two weeks since their injury. Alex opens the original x-ray and looks at it 
then looks at the new one. He uses a tool on the screen to make a red measuring line. He draws in a couple, it in a couple of places, then turns to me and says that it is a bit on the, of a borderline case, then looks at the screen and demonstrates that in one place, he can draw something like a nine millimeter line, not quite 10 millimeter, which is, you remember the classificatory uh, requirement. But if you measure it where he thinks it seems more obvious, it's only seven millimeters. So I've tried to sort of indicate this difference here. Oh, this X-ray is just a random example. It doesn't have the right measures. Um, the new image looks the same. Technically, the patient has a non-displaced fracture, meaning that they would not have needed to be referred. Uh, but then again, it's hard to really know. Let's see, he says, then calls in the patient. The patient is elderly and in a lot of pain. Then uh, when asked how it's going, their answer is hesitative. Alex explains that the shoulder looks good on the x-ray, but that of course there is still some healing to be done and it will continue to be painful for some weeks, but then it should stop. He adds that the important part now is that the patient slowly starts doing some easy movement with their arm so that they don't get, stiff, get a stiff, stiff elbow or shoulder joint. The patient gets a leaflet with photos and instructions. Alex asks the patients how, patient how they feel about this plan and if they think they can follow up with their own doctor or they want to come again. Again, the patient seems very hesitant and Alex and the patient agree that the patient will come back in four weeks for a follow-up. This I know to be the normal procedure for a two-part fracture. The patient leaves, then the door, door, when the door shuts, Alex turns to me and says something like, they seemed like they needed some monitoring. This is technically what it means to have a displaced fracture. So let us treat it like that. So here is another case, there's a team missing. The experienced surgeon is having the morning run through with two surgeons in training. For each patient, they are instructed to open the X-ray in chronological order, even if the system is slow in loading and there might be three or four images. The program opens the frontal and the side image uh, in one go next to each other. They point to the frontal image when they're asked for the classification. One X-ray comes up where they don't agree. The experienced surgeon wants to classify it higher than the surgeons in training. They ask why. He points to the sideways photo and explains that you can see that the fragment is pushed quite far backwards, uh, forward or backwards, I'm not sure. He notes that he is aware that they're not supposed to be using this image for classification, but argues that even if you can't see it on the frontal photo, it's in principle there because anatomically, this other X-ray cannot look like it does unless there is a general displacement of the segment. Right. Okay, so a few notes on these cases. So first, in uh, his 2002 review, Nia reveals that this criterion of a 10 millimeter displacement uh, that he said is actually just randomly picked. He had to set some criterion. And he recognizes that because of this, borderline cases will have to be evaluated as either displaced or not displaced or minimally displaced for other reasons. He also argues that findings during, for example, surgery may mean that you reclassify uh, your uh, fracture. And hence, he seems to fully accept that intake of other sources of knowledge might influence the classification. So as such, uh, even these non-conventional ways of classifying uh, doesn't necessarily go against NIST system. The second thing uh, to note uh, is uh, going back to my comment about um, uh, the distinction between classification and diagnostics. So in scenario one, this might seem to be one of the cases where we think that those two notions come apart. So we might want to say that the surgeon is abandoning this classification system in order to make a different diagnosis. However, it seems to me that he is still drawing on ideas from this very same classification system to make the diagnostic decision to reclassify the patient. Uh, and as I've stated, what I'm interested in in this talk is to find out what exactly uh, this classificatory system then uh, plays, what role that plays here in, in him making this decision. So the points I take from these two um, cases is that rather than the surgeons, uh, is rather that the surgeons can abandon certain parts of the classificatory system 
while still perceiving themselves as maintaining a use of the system and being loyal to it in their reasoning. Right. So now to the sort of second larger part. Um, so unless I think we want to just straight out say that the near classification is a bad system, it's unhelpful, um, really just bad habits, it seems that we can't make sense of what's going on uh, in terms of uh, thinking of classifications as, as sets of rules to follow. So this, the, this type of reasoning we might call deductive or rule-based inference. So here we would typically expect uh, what you can call monothetic, monothetic or polythetic classification that provide strict, necessary and sufficient conditions for uh, determining categories. So I think maybe like pathogen classifications seem to have this uh, more rule-based or monothetic uh, character, although there are questions about how to distinguish between uh, symptom showing and non-symptom showing uh, pathogen bearers. And similarly, I think the DSM as a st statistical operational classification at least sort of aims at being uh, this type of uh, classification, providing a set of rules for uh, classifying cases by either. Uh, multiple necessary or clustered symptoms. So um, instead of rule-based, one might argue that classification happens in a sort of what I've called predictive induction. What I mean by this is just induction from a bunch of cases to a new case rather than to a, a general law uh, from, yeah, from multiple cases. So in a crude version, one could say, well, the reason he's uh, in the first um, scenario uh, monitoring this patient is that the last 10 instances of patients from with a displacement from seven to nine uh, needed monitoring. So uh, then it follows that this patient uh, might need it as well. I think that type of argument is very rarely explicitly made uh, for classificatory systems, but something similar can be going on when we talk about prototypical theories or notions of medical judgment. There is something going on about accumulating enough cases to be able to select uh, prototypical cases or uh, their variations. So this can also be made sense of in a lot of other ways, but um, let's say it's one way to think about induction. Um, now, if we think about uh, clinical reasoning in these terms, it seems that the classificatory system either is completely superfluous because it doesn't show up at all in the reasoning or it shows up, but we still have no idea what role it plays. So in a recent paper, um, this is meant to be like prototype. <laughs> in a recent paper, Francesco Gagliardi uh, argues that there is some space for induction, especially in making nosological uh, classificatory systems. Uh, but that by and large classification of specific cases happens as argument from analogy, whether this be analogy from a cli class, a type, which he terms asymmetrical analogy or analogy between cases, so prototypical uh, reasoning, which he terms symmetric analogy. He then references uh, Amos Tversky, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that, um, who's a cognitive scientist, uh, and argues that we can think of disease classes a bit like portraits. So he writes, nosological diagnosis is thus a process in which given a patient, the diagnostician comes to a diagnosis by comparing the patient at hand to a set of morbid pictures composed of both well-known uh, typical syndromes and particular clinical cases. Right, so this, sounds very similar to accounts of classification that you find also in, in notions of classification as ideal types, uh, the sense of pattern recognition, um, and, and the same uh, also works for the prototype. Um, returning to um, Bison and Kenny's um, entry on uh, the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia, uh, they write, in some subspecialities, in particular pattern recognition, often using pictorial representations seem to be common, and hence diagnosis is a form of recognizing repeated patterns. 
So this, you read this and you're like, sure, this is what's going on. You know, pictorial representations, patterns, all very good. But then they go on. However, this approach can be dangerous, particularly among novices, given the large number of similar patterns among common diseases. So it seems then that we have a reliable account of classification in terms of typification and analogical argument, that even if we have that, there is still at least some pressure to ensure that the patterns are rooted in some satisfactory difference that we can sort of claim that our patterns do actually pick up different things. Um, and again, it seems that such an account might perhaps you know, allow some uncertainty, uh, but it's still, uh, but still find it the lacking uncertainty a problem more so than than surgeons seem to be finding it. So what I want to suggest here is uh, that we can take a bit of a closer look on analogical reasoning, and that this might help us uh, with uh, an alternative notion of classification from analogical reasoning based on reasoning processes rather than on analogical arguments, and that. Um, Sorry. Yeah, so rather than the analogical argument for which um, Gadiadi is, uh, seems to be sort of uh, taking his account, uh, where uh, analogy becomes something similar to sort of merely recognizing uh, similarity. So namely, uh, I want to suggest an alternative notion that takes classification systems more like models than ideal types. Right. So analogical reasoning has a long philosophical history and as many other things in philosophy, we can trace it back to Aristotle. Um, however, the most influential philosopher to develop this uh, in the context of inquiry is probably Mary Hesse. She famously developed a schematic for analogy uh, for analogical reasoning and inference that I've tried to uh, map up here. I've actually kind of halfway stolen this from uh, Bartha, Paul Bartha. Um, so this, the schema works like this. Something is an analogy for something else. When we can list uh, a number of relevant features that uh, S, the source system, uh, a number of relevant features of S, so the source system here, it's the earth. And this is the vertical element, the number of features uh, for the particular system. And then align them one-to-one -one with features of the target system, which is T, and here it's mass. This alignment then is the horizontal element of analogical reasoning. For the analogy uh, to work, we have to have a certain number or certain kind or certain kind of relation between uh, known, these known similarities between the two systems. And for the analogy to be inferentially interesting, we need to then be able to uh, have a, a further um, feature of the source system that we can then infer as plausible uh, as also a feature of the target system. So this is then the inferred similarity. Right. Usually, in order for us to deem this inference plausible, uh, as I've already said, we might, and people have posited a bunch of different requirements for both the vertical and the horizontal features um, of this uh, relation. The idea is then that a model can serve as a, a plausible source of inference uh, for a system as long as it fulfills these criteria and allows us to do this um, analogical mapping aligning. So I think it's important to note this sort of uh, aim towards plausibility. Uh, and I think that this also goes for the classificatory practices that I've briefly uh, described. So I hope that I haven't given the impression when I talk about unproblematically problematic uh, ideas about classification uh, of sort of apathy or indifference. So it's definitely not the case that the surgeons don't care about what class they pick up. They do care uh, about somehow picking out plausible categories or uh, classifications for their patient cases. 
So this sort of direction towards uh, making plausible inferences, I think, is 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 important. So theories about analogical reasoning and more often about analogical arguments um, have tended to focus a lot on uh, making these. Uh, ensuring the possibility of the inferences. So this means that a great deal of uh, focus has been given to uh, what is termed the positive analogy. So these are all the known positive correlations or things that we can align that we know are similar between the systems. And also to the negative, uh, no, sorry, to the neutral uh, analogies, which is the potential inferred similarities. So neutral in the sense that we still don't know whether they're positive or negative. We don't, don't know whether the, the two system are, systems are in fact similar. Right. I think that there's something to be said for negative analogies in anal analogical reasoning. And I think so, uh, not just out of sort of my own uh, ideas, uh, but because uh, uh, cognitive scientists such as uh, Deirdre Gentner and her colleague Francesco Maravilla uh, list analogical alignability as one of the important traits in difference detection. So to explain this, they give this example. When people are confronted with uh, one of these two images and asked which uh, to rate the difference or uh, whether how different these flowers are. Usually people are quicker in the case B to list them. Okay, <laughs> that these are, um, the case B flowers are very different from each other. But when you ask people to provide list of, lists of all the differences that you find in these pictures, people provide both longer list and Quicker, are quicker at providing these lists in case A. So that is in the case where there is stronger analogical alignment, right? So these would be, the differences would be strong analogical alignment, but then all the negative analogies becomes the differences. Let's go back to the near classification. Here we are presented with a classificatory system. And I think that the term system is very important. So that is, there's several possible classes for which the specific patient's shoulder can be taken to belong to. And we might think of these as, I don't know, prototypes or ideal types. I think Nia would, would probably think that there are ideal types. But the point is not so much about what type of things these classes are, uh, but rather uh, it is that uh, they they provide the opportunity to do analogical alignment. So finding the horizontal relations between the patient case and the different cases, cases in the classificatory system. And then the difference detection that this allows. So in scenario two, uh, where it became, so this is where uh, he looked at the other, the uh, experienced surgeon looked at the side photo. It becomes, um, important that despite a good pictorial alignment, it seems that uh, there are other elements that count as negative analogies and in favor of classifying the case as a different type of class in this uh, whole system. Right. So the inferred, to go back to Hess's schema, the inferred similarity here would simply be uh, the selected class. Um, so uh, the near cl uh, class would be the source system, not the classification system, but the near specific near class would be the source system and the patient would be the target system. So how, uh, however, um, sorry, however, the classificatory system maintains the function. And I think this is important. And this is um, what I hope that that I've showed. So the classificatory system maintains a function in reasoning, even if it turns out uh, that there is no good fit, that we can't make the uh, inferred similarity, or if it turns out that there are several possible inferred similarities. And I just want to sort of quote a surgeon uh, that I interviewed here. So we were talking about um, classification in general, uh, not just the near classification. And I asked him, 
whether and how he uses classific uh, classifications in his work. And he replied, there are some classifications you use often, uh, pretty often, and then there are some that you don't use because you find out what's important and what's not important. That's probably why when I was younger, I always looked up, looked them, the classifications up for everything because back then you didn't know what was important and what wasn't. Right, so I think what the surgeon is saying here is that one of the main purposes for him in using classificatory systems is as a um, tool of attention direction or guidance. So classificatory systems help their user not just by sort of picking out certain aspects of the world, uh, but by locating salient features of the patient case. And just to go back to Nier, I think this is maybe what he meant uh, when he said that the near classification system shouldn't be understood as a mere uh, numerical classification, but rather as a concept or a mental image. Right. I think maybe that's my time. Thank you so much. And I'm very happy for questions and comments. Uh, so yeah, now we'll go to, to Q and A. Um, so for people who are listening online, uh, you could either raise your hand and we should see you in the participants list, um, or you could put a, a Q in the chat and then uh, we'll ask you to read your question out loud. But equally, if you'd prefer just to type your question into the chat, then, then we'll read it out loud here as well. And that will work. The people in the room, just raise your actual hands and that will work just fine. Okay, we're back. Maybe also, Sorry? Uh, it's a video. Sorry. Hi. Showing how, despite having done hybrid events for such a long time, I still don't really know what I'm doing. Um, uh, I can see uh, that Arjun, you have a, a hand raised online. So why don't we start there? So you, if you could unmute yourself, um, and you're also welcome to turn on your camera. We can now see you. That would be nice too. And um, take it away, Arjun. Hello. Hold on. <clears throat> Hi. Thank you very much. Um, that was really interesting. I have a question. So there is one kind of use of classification that I'm not sure you mentioned, and I was just wondering about your thoughts on it. So. One, it seems to be that one of the main gripes that people have about the near classification is a lack of inter-observer reliability, right? So why should that be a gripe? Why should that be the thing that most people seem to complain about? They're not really, there isn't that much disagreement about whether or not it's a prognostic value, whether or not it's, um, useful in terms of deciding surgical approaches because it's an anatomical classification system. But one thing that people do use classification systems for a lot is just to formulate a common language in medicine with which different clinicians can communicate reliably without significant loss of information because you can't give an extremely fine detailed anatomical description every time you want to write down, write something down. Um, and that's why in terms of reliability really matters. Right, so it's just, a, it's just an information capturing device. Right, um, so maybe I can sort of give it to, to answer to in two different ways. So about the common language. Uh, so actually the same surgeon that I was quoting uh, also talks about how some classifications are very useful because you just say the class and then everyone in the room in the morning, so in this morning conference, I don't know if that's the same morning meeting. It's a very uh, sort of half an hour, you go through a bunch of things and there's a lot of people with high salaries that don't want to waste their time. So you need to be efficient, right? And some of the classifications work to just efficiently say it's this way. Like, 
uh, but then he said he also, especially when he was younger, would look up a lot of classification systems that no one knew what meant. And he would bring them up in these morning meetings, not as a tool of um, communicate of efficient communication, but because bringing them up reminds people of what features are important to discuss in certain cases. Um, so the way that these different classification systems work uh, guide the discussions about certain cases in terms of what features should we pay attention to in these x-rays that we're all sitting looking. So I don't think that the, I don't want to challenge that they also serve a communication purpose, but I don't think that's sufficient for explaining their um, role. And then to the other thing, why are people so worried about this inter-observer uh, reliability? I mean, if you, you can say that maybe it predicts, it's good prognostic and it's good for um, deciding whether to give surgery or not, but if it seems like people are not classifying the same way, it seems that very quickly these things also fall apart. So if people don't use the classification according to the all, if they don't classify the same cases the same way, then it doesn't matter that the classifications are linked to prognostics. If it seems like then it's random what prognostic the patient is going to get. Uh, so the, the sort of idea is that you need you need to, so that, so in the case where accurate classification is important because that leads to accurate prognostics, in those conceptualizations of uh, clinical classifications, then it's a problem with inter-observer, lack of inter-observer reliability because the whole system collapses. Um, right, I think that was... I had another thought, but uh, it disappeared. Maybe I'll get it back to me. Okay, we have a, a question in the in the in the center of the room, just behind Rivka. Yes. Hi, I'm Boris. Uh, uh, I actually had a connected question. Uh, again, about uh, well, can everyone online hear this? Um, I think they might struggle a bit. We couldn't get a mic for this okay. room, so uh, would can you speak up? It's good to stretch my <laughs> legs a bit so that it doesn't ossify. Uh, anyway, so yeah, um, my, I'm Polaris Boy, um, just visiting here. Uh, so, um, so I was wondering about something a bit connected to what Arjun asked about. Uh, so you didn't really, uh, apologies if it goes a bit outside the scope of your presentation. So one of the things that we do with classifications is uh, clinical research, right? So we research what's, what would be the best interventions for what sorts of, uh, of con conditions and ailments. Um, so, so I was wondering if, um, I guess it's like uh, the way you portray it or the way, the way I, I hear it is, is, you know, the clinicians are first and foremost interested in uh, the individual patient's outcome at every time. And then, you know, the, the classifications are just one tool that they might use to get a, a good outcome. And then uh, obviously then, then they serve as these kinds of really rough heuristics, uh, if, if even those. But, um, but when it comes to like, if, if you want to collate uh, clinical outcomes and see, you know, knee injuries, should we typically intervene or not? Uh, or, uh, or do any other sorts of, sorts of uh, replicable, replicable research, then there's suddenly the classification will seem to play a much stronger role there. Uh, and do you think that's an obstacle for doing clinical research at all? If, if the uh, kind of uh, con conceptual demands of clinical research are at odds with uh, how these conceptual instruments are in fact used by the people who would be collecting the data. Right. Um, so as I uh, said, this, these two things were going on at the same time in where I was doing my, my field work. And it's definitely something that I, uh, that I think I should do another paper on. <laughs> but, but there is, um, so I think my initial approach to the project was this whole fuss about getting clinical categorizations right seems really unnecessary. But then as soon as it turns into or, or enters into this more uh, like the scientific um, 
frame where you're not just using classificatory systems, but making up classificatory systems or uh, finding uh, relations between classifications and prognostics and so on, it becomes much more important that you're clear on uh, what classes you're, you're referring to. Um, and I think there is, Yeah, I don't know. I just agree with what you said, basically. And I'm, I I want to write another paper <laughs> on that at some point. Um, but um, but I think at least it's because I think med philosophy of medicine sometimes tend to at least the sort of more uh, sort of the branch that comes out of philosophy of science tend to very quickly go back into medical science and forget about what goes on in the clinic and what's important for classifications in the clinic. Uh, so, so that's maybe also why I'm trying to do just that in this in this aspect. So, try and remind philosophers that you know we're not just all scientists. That's good. Okay, there's another another question uh, online. So, um, Karen. Hi, thank you very much for this paper. It was uh, super interesting. Um, I was wondering a little bit both about the the divide between a kind of scientific division of classifications and and the clinical one um and I was worried about or wondering about the the social aspect of it um which comes back to Arjun's question about communication um but in a sense communication is about is a little bit like the scientific categories in that they try to describe the world. And something I was wondering might be more important in the clinic and which might, which might also help you with the difficulty of um, observer reliability is that what's used in the clinic is a diagnostics that goes or a classification that goes close to the decision branch points. So in a sense, by saying it's one or the other of two that might give you a different treatment, that's a little bit of a kind of stop sign to the other doctors. Okay, this is where we need to look. And this is actually where we might need to branch into two different treatments because that's what's really important to the clinical doctors and in that case it might be that there's a clustering exactly around those branch points which makes it quite hard to get it right when you're trying to check whether clinicians get it right because it it's more like attention to this than necessarily uh, about describing a group of cases. Yes. yes. Does that make any sense? Is that the question sense. like this? Can, can I go back to my slides somehow? I don't. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's just a big kind on my screen. Right. Uh, so can they see my? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually had. I skipped over a part. Um, about how um oh, I'll just over that part. There you go. Um sometimes uh classificatory reasoning is I, I think I, I think about it as becomes distributed. So what typically happens in uh at the hospital where I was doing my field work was the patients come into the A and E. And then the first person that meets them is not an orthopedic surgeon. It's it's a usually a very young, uh, just finished out of med school. Um, and what they do is they decide whether the, the fracture is minimally displaced or not. And so they basically use two classes of, class of uh, uh, shoulder break. They use minimally displaced or all the other things. And if it's minimally displaced, the patients get told to hold their shoulders still for a certain amount of time, and then they need to go to their own doctor. If it's not minimally displaced, then the patient gets uh, referred further on to the orthopedic surgeons. And then the first question that gets asked is, is the fracture uh, intersecting with the, the joint part? If it is, it needs immediate attention. 
especially because I think I can't remember which one, but one of these uh, might uh, cause a blockage in the blood supply for the arm and you can lose an arm and all this stuff. So it's very important to be uh, aware. Uh, if it's one of the other uh, two, three, four parts, they'll wait for two weeks before they come back. So, right. This was just to say, Kain, I think you're very right in that um, classificatory systems also, so we have this very neat depiction, but they also vary depending on what branch uh, point you're at and what sort of classes are relevant to take in when you're making classifications in the clinic. I think, I would say that the idea of saying of of thinking about the role that then the differences play in terms of this sort of analogical alignment and difference detection is still a, works even when it's just a two part classificatory system as long as they're two right great thanks uh, back into the room with Julia. Thank you, Helen, for the, for the lecture. It was really, really nice. Uh, I was wondering, because uh, when you, uh, with the examples that you gave, I was thinking about the level of accuracy that you had in the classification, right? So, of course, uh, the more accurate you try to be in the classification, uh, the less likely you're going to be able to uh, sometimes apply to a diversity uh, of factors in real life without making some changes. Like, let's say, if you just have two categories, like, did you injure, uh, is your arm, did you hurt your arm or not? This is very broad, not accurate at all, and not useful, really. But you can apply this in real life because, you, okay, you hurt your arm or not, but not, not really useful. So to make it useful, you need to be more accurate. And then it becomes harder to apply some, especially in the, like the borderline cases or things involving more variables like, the, the two cases that you presented in the first one, uh, the surgeon had to adapt the classifications, let's say, to the symptoms of the patient or some other things that were not tangible at the moment, or to say she's in a lot of pain, so we're going to treat her as if she was in a higher degree of the scale, right? And in the second case, the, the surgeon, the more senior surgeon, had to adapt the, the grade of the lesion to based on his own experience to the limitations of the X-ray, right? Because it, it is a limited uh, exon. You cannot see the, the bone in uh, three, the, three dimensions. You, know, you cannot see the, the soft parts of the tissue and stuff, but he knows that the, the bone cannot be in that position unless something else happened that the exon does not portray, right? So all these things, I think they show like the limitations of the scale or whatever you are, however you are measuring something that has such a huge number of variables, you try to limit that to some few variables that become your uh, items of your, for comparison or for, for analogy. But what I would like to ask you that uh, when you uh, present the example of the, the plants or something like that that you make, do you make uh, a comparison uh, when you show the example of the analogy between the, the two plants or yeah. between Earth and Mars or yeah, something yeah, like that? Yeah. Did you use the, the analogical uh, approach as uh, something to be used instead of uh, the classification of the cases? Or this is how we understand the classification by analogy with the real case. And then we just have to try to adapt to, to, to some new uh, stage in medicine when we try to recognize there is a huge number of variables that sometimes the the some any given scale never be sufficient for to treat with a very uh, they might be useful to the very clear cut cases when you know okay this is clearly this one or this other one but when you come to the bifurcations on the road like uh, the other uh, participant said earlier you need to be aware of a huge number of uh, uh, of variables that your experience of some more sophisticated scale, some sophisticated uh, scales will need to 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 be developed to approach that. So I would like to ask you between I, I didn't understand the comparison between the classification and the analogical. Are, are these supposed to work together or uh, in opposition to the other? Right. So I think this is because I I um so the 
example with the planets mm -hmm. is just a very plain example of an, an analogical argument. And this, I think, maps on to what, uh, I forgot the name, the Italian uh, philosopher, um, Leon? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, what he talks about when he suggests that um, we should think about classification as analogical. So it's sort of merely is maybe not a fair word to use, but it's the, the notion that you have two cases and then you find similarities, you map similarities, and then you can infer that those are the same uh, sort of phenomenon. So that's an example of what I think he means. What I then wanted to suggest was, was that I think that still creates problems in the sense that um, if that's the case, we want to know that these similarities pick out the right things. Somehow that they don't just, it's not just similar to all types of shoulder breaks. Mm -hmm. Like everyone has a, everyone who broke their shoulder has a pain in their arm almost. Uh, so we don't want to make analogies like that. Um, but what I then wanted to suggest that to, is to think about analogy in a slightly different way, in the same way that we think about the role that models play in uh, science. So here, I think, if I understood you correctly, so there you actually have cases where you have very complex systems with lots of variables and um, lots of um, sometimes uh, uh, sort of feedback loops and all sorts of things, very similar to human bodies. Um, and, and what you then do to try and make sense of this is you simplify in a model. Um, and then there's a big discussion about whether models then can even tell you something about these systems. Right? Mm -hmm. But one way to argue that they can in fact tell you about these systems is to say that there is some analogical reasoning going on between the more simple model and the much more complex case. And um, I need to get a lot more into this literature of how particularly these arguments are made, but I think one way of, of, of making these arguments is that it's a way of highlighting salient features. Um, right, so in the argument I'm trying to make, the Earth-Mars analogy is not a good analogy because those are both equally complex or not complex or whatever. It's more about sort of uh, let's say like um, Bohr's model of the uh, atom, which is a very simple model of a very complex system. Okay, there's a question in the chat, or oh, there's one above this that I was going to read out. Okay, so Victoria asks, Thank you for deliberating and delivering your fascinating ideas. When you say classification systems serve as a tool to direct a practitioner's attention towards certain important features of a patient's condition, do you find this more problematic in a case of classification of the psychological disorders? Right. So this is uh, for the the part of my talk that I wasn't that I didn't deliver on. Um, I don't know if I find it more or less problematic. I think the first question is to ask whether this also works for psychiatric um, classification. Uh, I would, this, this, my hunch is that it would work. And in particular, my hunch is, is based on the fact that it seems like uh, ironically, uh, Psychiatry and orthopedic surgery share uh, a big rely, uh, reliance on nosological um, classification. Um, so even if they seem sort of quite different, they they do tend to have similar types of uh, or some similarities in the classification systems. So the first question is whether that will work. I think then. Uh, I don't know if it's, I don't know. I mean, I think I would say that if that's the way it works, it doesn't become more problematic to 
describe it as working this way. Uh, but of course, it, it might be problematic that uh, um, if we have bad categories, we really uh, notice bad things, but I don't know, bad categories in psychiatry just seems bad, uh, even in, in sort of classical. Yeah, I, I, I need to think more about the sort of, I think I've been mostly thinking about whether that even, the transfer even is possible. Elana? Yeah. So yeah, thank you for the talk. I was just um, wondering, kind of, in your experience, did you notice that, I guess, especially more junior doctors were erring on the side of caution? And so if it was, a, if you found that it was a, they thought it might be nine millimeters, there wasn't much to lose just offering another appointment in two weeks, that they would therefore be kind of trying to fit them into the classification that makes it seem more severe. And because the other example with the surgeon who's looking at the other film is also saying, well, no, because you've got this other piece of evidence, it's going to make it worse. And therefore, whether there was less kind of in the reliability between observers, if there's ever a case where people are making it less serious, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I can only say <laughs> from like my field work in one orthopedic department. So, um, I think in, I don't know, like there's, uh, at least in the Danish context, some awareness about like surgery is quite riskful, uh, like full of risks. Uh, so, class, so sort of erroring on the side of, uh, severe classification that means surgery is not something that's necessarily encouraged or a good thing. No. Um, and then also there's a, a, an increasing focus on uh, x-rays and the um, uh, risks that that involve. And, and when you're classified higher, you typically uh, follow more closely with x-rays, right? So there's... I think there are def them. I I don't know. There might be forces that make you want to see patients again, just to be sure that you didn't make a grave mistake of of letting them go. But but there are also a lot of forces that work the other way. I think, um, and and uh, they always tell the doctors always tell the patients that within. I think it's so. This is how the Danish system works. When you've been at a specialist clinic, uh, your reference or your referral is open for three months or something, or six months, I can't remember. But within that period, you can always call them again if something shows up and come back. So they always make sure even if they, yeah, if they end the, the patient, like if the if in the first case, he would have sent the patient home, he would have told the patient, if this and this happens, just come back in. Right? And he also asked her to, or him, I can't remember, to go to, um, to their own doctor. So there's, a, yeah, yeah, there's some <laughs> framework there at least to, to prevent that from happening, but I can't tell you if, if that's actually what then happens. It's sort of like, you know, the diagnosis is the only basic is not, they're going to be operated on, but they're going to have another appointment, but there might be a difference. If the change in classification wasn't, it's a stage of operation. No, no, no. It was, you need follow-up. You need follow-up, but you need more x-rays. Yeah. Um, you need more x-rays, but you also... Um, uh, yeah, I don't... I, I mean, that might be going on. I, I, that would, I think I would need to look at some statistics to give a proper... Yeah. Okay, there's another, um, there's another one online, which is also, I think in the chat. So, Bobby, if you're happy to to say your question, then do go ahead. Otherwise, I'll, I'll read it out from the chat. Uh, we can't hear you currently. Something perhaps wrong with your mic. You're not on mute, but we just can't hear you. No. Nod if you'd like me to read your question from the chat. Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> Thanks. And, and sorry we couldn't we couldn't uh, couldn't hear from you properly. Okay. So the question says: 
Ah, you did say your audio starts acting up. Okay. This also ties into some of the other questions that have been asked so far. If a low inter-observer reliability for the near classification does not lead to low inter-observer agreement on treatment, then does not imply that the near classification, if nothing else, is too fine-grained. Whether we think the classification in terms of models or ideal types, or in other words, if two different near classes are equivalent in terms of the kind of treatment they require, then why distinguish between those two near classes at all? Right. Um, so from 1970 to 2002, as I, I need to check exactly which ones, because, um, but I'm pretty sure that actually uh, Neil already took out some of the categories because of this um, issue that some of them seem uh, non-relevant and and in recent years it's partly because of the work of uh, Wilson uh, it's become clear that that you, uh, some of these two or three part fractures you don't need to intervene on in the same uh, extent that you, you did so they might become that distinction might become um, irrelevant um, I th think I don't know. I think this relates somehow to the statement that Nir made about the, the difference between whether it's the classificatory system is supposed to be this numerical division of all the different relevant classes or whether it's supposed to convey a framework for... So um, I wrote here that maybe it's not an analogy, maybe it's a conceptual framework for understanding fractures. But I don't know what the different what that you so 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 yeah so so I think some of the classes that seem to be the same type in one column or require the same intervention in other columns the distinction on the other sort of uh, axis becomes important. So certain fields, does that make sense? In the certain fields in the matrix might overlap, but if you um, hook them out, you would uh, be missing features that are important in other, uh, took the distinction out between the three or four segments and the four possible anatomical segments that you get. Does that, does that make any sense? I don't know, can you nod or? Uh, uh, yeah, so maybe he wrote something. <laughs> Good. Good, right. Yeah, so I think this, the, the, the difference might lie or the important detail might be in this, that the point is not to only map out the sort of the actual relevant classes. Okay, I, I had a question of my own and we're at the sort of end of the queue I have, but we still have 10 minutes left. So if anyone else does have another question and do do jump in. But in the in the meantime, I could ask uh, whether this, whether you think this, so I was thinking of, let's say in one of these meetings, there are two people who disagree about which is the correct classification. Um, and it seems as though they might be, your way of understanding what the classificatory system is sort of for, what its function planes, plays suggest there might be different ways of understanding what's going on when these people disagree. It could be because they literally just think the measurement is is different or is being measured wrong or something, or there could be kind of some other more subtle thing going on where they are disagreeing about something to do with where the attention should be focused or something like that. I was wondering if you looked at that, whether you kind of came across cases of people disagreeing or whether you would sort of agree that there's a, you have some resources here to interpret disagreement among clinicians differently yeah. from how we might. I mean, I, yeah, I think that would be really interesting. There is the problem that medicine is very hierarchical and there was often one expert in the room. Um, so even if disagreement was allowed, um, like voice different opinions uh, from both sort of ends of the hierarchy, the immediate um, 
conception was that the younger ones had misunderstood something. Um, so I, I, I've, I don't, I wish I had seen more sort of maintained disagreement, disagreements, and disagree, whatever. Hmm. Um, and actually, this is, I think, one of the things I would uh, like to uh, do more observation. So I know that because of them doing these clinical trials, uh, I think once every three months or something, they go through all the patients they've included and reclassify, have like a panel of people and they all give their classifications and then they discuss in order to be sure that they've classified them properly for the scientific standards. Um, this didn't happen when I was there, but I would love to go back and, and see this because then you would have, I think, several experts that could could have. So yeah, I, I um, think that would be really interesting. Um, okay, so that was just like a practical thing. I think in terms of uh, like thinking about models, so what happens if we disagree about how to interpret the result of a um, simulation in science, for example. Um, usually we would then think that either, you know, we have different conceptions of what the model is doing, or we have even different theories about what it is that we're exploring. Um, so I guess that something similar if I was to go all out on my uh, proposal, mm. would be to say that, well, then it's actually because the one doctor and the other doctor hold different theoretical ideas about what it means to have a uh, displaced uh, fracture, or um, I don't know, yeah, mm. uh, the different theoretical framework somehow. Yeah. Um, cool. Thanks. Any other questions in the room? Yeah. Ah, ah, I just sorry. It's a long walk back. It's great to have so much time for the Q and A to get to ask another one. So here is a normative question. Like you have been talking very descriptively about like this is how people use these classifications, yeah. and I guess the obvious follow up question is, you know, should they be doing that? Like particularly, like if I mean, every once in a while a story comes up. I was trying to look look for one that uh, came up uh, a while ago. But I didn't find it. I would have wanted to say something about it in more detail. But anyway, uh, a they had done like a study in uh, Swiss dentist clinics where they had had like a um, healthy research assistants going there, dentally healthy research assistants going there for assessment, um, and then um, the across the clinics, every single clinic would uh, in uh, recommend some intervention or another. Uh, and these recommended dental interventions, such as uh, fillings, uh, spanned uh, across the various kid clinics for the same uh, research assistant. They would span thirteen different teeth. So, 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 <laughs> so that I mean, that's kind of alarming. And obviously, they, they and they also did these experiments where the participants would be dressed in uh, clothing indicative of different social, uh, so, social economic backgrounds, and that also had an influence on on how many fillings they they were uh, <laughs> suggested to have. So, so uh, uh, I mean, it's not far fetched to think that this also has to, uh, like, when when it comes to fractured bones, that there would have be uh, similar sorts of uh, just mistakes going on. And obviously, people are uh, people make mistakes, but I'm just wondering, like, what's your What's your and obviously uh, the doctors are trying to do a diligent job, right? And they have a story of as to why they use the classification they the way they do. Uh, but what's your take on like whether this is the best way to protect the patients or whether they should in fact be uh, following the classifications more closely to prevent uh, patient injuries and adverse outcomes? Right. So I think like I've already brought up there, there are, uh, you know, pros and cons of following patients more closely. So it's not just risk-free that you have these follow-up sessions, um, especially in orthopedics. 
Um, I think I can also hide slightly behind the fact that there is actually some agreement in, in treatment um, suggestions, right? So even if they disagree on the classifications, it doesn't seem like they're very uh, certain teeth um, in their recommendation of treatment. Um, Okay, so this is completely anecdotal, but um, I think there has been a tradition for, um, we, call, we call it like knife hungry uh, mm -hmm. surgeons mm -hmm. uh, for, for a lot of very legitimate reasons. I mean, you need a certain amount of surgeries a year to be able to continue to practice and all this stuff. And you also become a surgeon because you like doing surgery, right? Um, but I think that there is strong, similar to the sort of movements against using too much x-ray, recent sort of younger, or maybe, I don't know, new fractions in the surgical community are doing a lot of work to counteract some of these problematic tendencies in the, in the field. Um, Mostly in the in sort of I would say maybe descriptive way of not like that it's bad to do surgery or like normatively bad to to do surgery, but but just pointing out all the risks that you are giving the patient. So this uh, professor uh, person that I I'm referring to, he's he's doing a lot of uh, randomized uh, trials to desurgicalize certain classes to say well you know, maybe the x-ray looks really bad, but they actually have the same function, no pain, uh, et cetera, if we don't do surgery. And surgery is always in, sort of introducing risks. So why are we doing surgery if if we could get the same result risk-free ish? Um, yeah, so there's uh, just this sort of movement of, I don't know, um, like enlightenment almost about, um, all the things that surgeons used to love to do uh, <laughs> and being much more aware of that. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, that's, uh, it doesn't really relate to um, think about these classifications, but I think that's important to keep, you know, in mind. Uh, yeah. I think there's someone online. That has yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're very almost at time, but let's just squeeze in, squeeze in one last, last question from, from Ryan, that'd be great. Sure, yes, I'll try to keep it quick. Um, I just wanted to build off Bobby's question about the two different near classifications and if the same, if they lead to the same treatment, why they're different. And you said they're different, maybe there are, there's an axis or two or three different axes that differentiate the two classifications. So just, I'm trying to clarify that. So if they're, in my mind then, if there are two different classifications, but they lead to the same treatment, is part of the utility that they generate different models or like mental concepts of the shoulder or the injury. And so you have two different classifications that ultimately might lead to the same treatment, but they have different models. And so there might be different nuances. Um, and if so, like could part of it be that then those class classifications might be able to catch certain edge cases in what they're in what features they're trying to point out. Does that make sense? Kind of. Um, I just maybe clarify what I meant was that classification is very simply sort of in a um, so it has three classes at the top and four classes at the side or reverse depending on how you depict it. And um so it might be important to pay attention to whether there's a surgical neck fracture um in many cases it might be that in one in two between two particular classes where one has a neck uh, surgical neck fra uh, displacement and the other one doesn't have but has another dis uh, placement those two would require the same treatment but the fact of paying attention to the surgical neck displacement is still important for the entire system. Um, so you want it in there in the classificatory system uh, as a feature that can be relevant to pay attention to. And it might not be that, that that's, the, uh, that's the feature that, make, that makes the difference between 
uh, for treat for uh, intervention. Does that make some sense? So, so yeah. Okay, well, I think that does now does now take us to time. So thanks everyone for, for all of your questions. Thanks for a great discussion. Uh, but most of all, let's uh, thank Helena for an excellent.